Hello and welcome to Baiju's exam prep IAS. A very very warm good morning to everyone. It is 10 a.m. means it is time once again for us to present before you the Hindu newspaper lists. I am glad that all of you have joined in here right on time despite this being a Sunday. As you know, every day at 10 a.m. we try and discuss some of the most important and relevant articles from the day's Hindu newspaper and the same we will be doing today also. Once again, thank you so much for everyone who have been joining here right on time. I am sure all of you by now would have subscribed to our YouTube channel. If not, make sure to hit the subscribe button. Make sure that you all attend the quiz that happens on our Telegram channel as soon as this session comes to an end. Now, without waiting any further, let's see what are the important articles that we have here for you today. Now, Interestingly, there are a lot of diverse articles in the Hindu newspaper today from many different subjects. The first article that we have taken up is about the earthquake in Turkey. Now, <clears throat> I'm sure all of you would have been following the news story of the devastating earthquake in Turkey and Syria. Now, although it is extremely unfortunate, the death toll is still increasing every single day. But the fact is from the UPSC examination point of view, you are not to read about how many people have died. You're not supposed to read about that specific incident. When these kind of natural calamities actually occur, for you, from the examination point of view, it is more important for you to analyze why did the earthquake take place there, that is Turkey, Syria specifically. What are the mechanisms behind this entire process? Also, can we have any other way in which we can mitigate the impact of earthquake. Yes, you all know that the scientific community has also said it is not possible to predict earthquakes, but it is possible to have technology so that we can reduce the devastation that is caused by the earthquakes. These are the two things that will be discussed in this article. The first theme of the article is, why is it that the earthquakes in Turkey were so deadly? Now, there are two or three ways to look at it. Number one, as you would have read in the newspapers by now, Turkey has always been susceptible to earthquakes. The reason being the location of Turkey. Now, Turkey lies over multiple fault lines in the tectonic plates and that is why it has always been a seismologically active area. Just to give you a brief background, the entire earth crust on which the entire world stands, this entire earth crust is made up of 15 tectonic plates. Tectonic plates can be understood as the underground or basically the foundation of the earth's crust. There are 15 in total. These plates are made up of different types of faults. So faults would be considered as lines in between the plates. Now when these faults interact with each other, when these faults are actually, let's say they are interacting with each other, one fault goes up, one plate goes down. This is when you have an activity that is release of energy that mainly leads to earthquakes. Now, earthquakes mainly occur at the site when these different plates are interacting with each other. Although it is not possible to predict when an earthquake will happen, but it is very easy to predict what are the places where the chances of having an earthquake are very, very high. Those are called the seismologically active zones from throughout the entire world. Now, if you look at the location of Turkey, it makes it very, very easy to predict that major earthquakes in Turkey will be very common. Let me show you the photo here. If you look at this, Turkey, if you can see here, there are multiple fault lines that are underneath Turkey. And that is why Turkey, in fact, has had a past of multiple earthquakes of very, very high magnitude. In fact, this time around also, although Turkey saw multiple earthquakes, the highest one, that is, the one with the highest magnitude was 7.8. There was another one of 7.5. And after that also, there have been many aftershocks that Turkey and Syria are still facing. Now, the problem here is, as I told you earlier, it is not possible to predict these earthquakes. But we have realized the fact, and when I say we, I mean the entire world. We have realized the fact that if we bring in certain changes, in the way that our buildings are constructed, we can reduce the devastation of the earthquakes considerably. I'll give you one example. <clears throat> Around the world, there are certain countries that are known for having technology using which they have been able to reduce the number of people who die of earthquakes. 
the one leader in this technology is Chile. The South American country of Chile. It is also one of those countries that has a very long history of earthquakes. In fact, one of the most devastating earthquakes in the history of the entire world, magnitude of nine and a half was in Chile only. Chile lies in a zone where they are used to seeing a lot of these earthquakes. So what Chile has done in the past few decades, they have actually made their building codes very, very tough. I'll discuss about this in just a bit. Building codes means a set of rules that the government of that country publishes. That set of rules has to be followed by every constructor. Anyone who builds a building in that country has to follow those rules. You have to understand this. How do people die in earthquakes? People die in earthquakes because because of the earthquake, the buildings actually are destroyed. The buildings fall down, they collapse. And when they collapse, this is when people actually get under them and that is how people lose their lives. So the entire idea when you have to save the lives of the people is in the building codes. Now, as I told you, every country, most countries have published their own building codes. India also has certain building codes. Building codes, as I told you, in very simple terms are the set of regulations that every building has to follow. It is not just about earthquakes. It is also about other problems such as if there is a fire, then how do you escape fire? So there are certain examples of how exactly can a building look like? What are the escape routes that you have to give? These are essential. Only when those building codes are followed, only then you receive the certificate from the side of the government that, okay, this building is safe enough to be occupied. So it's not that the entire world is just waiting for the earthquakes to come. Some countries have actually worked towards it. Not just Chile, there is one other example, Japan also. Japan also has had a long history of facing earthquakes and that is why they also have ensured that their building codes are made in such a manner that they are able to reduce the harmful impact of earthquakes. But again, the example of Chile is regarded as a most successful one. The reason being that Chile is not as rich of a country as Japan. See, it is not very easy that we will just publish building codes and every building will be fine and people will not die of earthquakes. When you publish building codes and when you tell the builders that you have to build a building in this specific manner so that earthquakes, fire, etc. would not cause such a big impact, that always increases the cost of construction as well. In developing countries, in least developed nations specifically, when you make the cost of construction, when you make the cost of the buildings high, it also leads to other problems in the economy. So it's not that easy that you can just publish new building codes and everyone will be safe. However, this is something that has been ignored in Turkey for a long, long time. Turkey, despite being at a place where experts have always predicted that there will be an earthquake, Turkey has not really worked towards mitigating that risk. In fact, just like and you can draw parallel to what happened in India's Joshi Mutt as well. Just like for Joshi Mutt, Many expert committees had said in the past that there is an issue in Joshimard, there would be land that would subside and that is why you have to ensure that construction does not happen at a very rapid pace in Joshimard. Similarly with Turkey also, there have been multiple reports in the past where the experts have suggested that Turkey lies in a very tectonically active zone and the construction should be done very, very carefully. But again, this warning of the experts was ignored in the past. There are other lessons that India also can take. As you know, <clears throat> some parts of India, especially North India, which lie near the Himalayas, they are also in seismologically active zones. We have seen how there have been very frequent earthquakes in Nepal. And scientists have said, that there might be a massive earthquake that might come to India as well in the nearby areas. That is the areas that lie in the Himalayan belt. How can we be prepared for this? Again, you cannot predict the exact timing of an earthquake, but you can ensure that the damage that is caused by the earthquake is reduced by how? By making sure there are safety measures in place. Now, these building codes that we are talking about, in Chile also, 
they have actually tried to make it better over time. This is not just a first quote that is published and everything is great. They also try to make it better each and every time. For example, Chile also has published five different quotes so far. With every new earthquake, they try to make changes in those codes, they try to make changes in those regulations, and they ensure that it becomes better and better and better. And that is how we are in a situation that in Chile now, even when we have earthquakes of seven and a half to eight, even then a very few people actually die in Chile. As compared to what we are seeing in Turkey, in a 7.8 earthquake, over 20,000 people have already lost their lives. Now, having said that, <clears throat> the Indian government has taken certain steps in this regard in the past. Let me tell you what exactly are those steps. Apart from, as we discussed, having the national building code that we had, apart from that also, there are certain other things that the government has been doing. For example, in India, we have the National Center for Seismology. It is an office that works under the Ministry of Earth Sciences. It collects as much data about the earthquakes as possible and suggests to the government how can we ensure that the government response for the earthquakes becomes better the next time around so that the number of people who lose their lives can be reduced. We also have the Building Material and Technology Promotion Council. This again undertakes study of what kind of material could be best suitable to avoid people losing their lives during earthquakes. They also suggest what exactly are the kind of materials that the government can prescribe? What is it that the government of India should suggest to the builders? What kind of materials should not be allowed? So on and so forth. All of that that we have is one of the examples of, or some of the examples of what the government of India has been doing. We also have the National Retrofit Program. This is a program that was run by experts from IITs, etc. They came out with guidelines again about how exactly can we ensure that even if there are certain buildings that were not built to sustain an earthquake, even the buildings that have already been built, in those buildings also, is it possible that we can make certain changes so that these buildings can become safer? That is also a study that has been conducted by multiple experts from the IIT. In fact, they have also suggested to the RBI that RBI should ask the banks not to give loan to any of those buildings which do not have these safety measures in place. Understand one more thing. See, there is no magic in these building codes, meaning that if there is an earthquake that is of a very high magnitude, if your building is built just over the fault line, no building code can save your building, as simple as that. The experts say that these building codes, be it the Indian building code, the Chile or any country whatsoever, these can provide certain protection. These can ensure that the buildings are safe against certain earthquakes. But when the earthquake is really high magnitude, when the building itself is just above the fault line, there is no possible code that will actually safeguard the building. So you can never be sure that there will be zero lives lost just because of these building codes that have been implemented. But yes, you can ensure that the number of people losing their lives would be lower. For example, the building material that is being used should be such that if the building material falls on the head of a person, maybe it should not cause as much damage as it usually would to a person and the person's life would be saved. These are the kind of building codes that if let's say there is a trimmer and people want to escape, there should be a way for people to escape from the building easily. This is what the building codes are supposed to do. No building code in the world can guarantee you that there will be zero casualties in any of the earthquakes or fire or all these kind of calamities. Before we go on to the second uh, article for the day, let me take up a few questions quickly. I'm also glad that you are answering each other's questions as well. <clears throat> yes, as I said earlier as well, uh, there are no specific ways, no scientific ways that you can actually predict an earthquake. The only thing that we can do at the end of the day is ensure that these earthquakes, when the buildings fall down, the material of these buildings as such, it does not harm the human body as such. 
I have a question, what is building code? Building code is a set of regulations published by the government of India or published by different countries. The, the rules and regulations of how, what should be a building like. When you build any construction, residential construction or an official construction, commercial construction, what are the things that you should keep in mind? What are the materials that you should use? So on and so forth. That is called the building codes. Okay. Akshay is asking which tectonic plate does Turkey present. So it is given in this article. So Turkey is actually, if you see, it is present at the fault line of multiple plates coming together. So Turkey and Syria lie at the confluence. That is the meeting point of three plates, not just one. There is the Arabian plate, the Anatolian plate and the Eurasian plate. These are the three plates that actually here come together where Turkey is located. As you can see here. The next article that we have here is about India's efforts to increase a border infrastructure. Now, this is in the news because recently what happened was the external affairs minister, that is Mr. S. J. Shankar, recently gave a report about what are the different infrastructures that the government of India has been building near the border areas. Now, this is very different why usually when you see these kind of informations given from the government, whenever usually you see the government tells the press, tells the newspaper that this is the construction that we are doing on uh, the border areas, etc. This is usually done in a press conference or usually when a question is asked in response to that question, the government gives out that information. But what has happened this time around is there was no plan of any meeting. There was no plan of any press conference. Without any plan, the, the foreign minister just brought this information to the public saying that our speed of making infrastructure near the border areas, especially border areas in neighboring uh, at the border of, let's say, Bangladesh, Bhutan, Nepal, Myanmar, China, all these, the construction activities are going on at a very, very fast pace. Now, this is where it's very interesting. Interesting in the sense that just a few weeks later, there will be certain Chinese officials that are supposed to visit India. Now, at a time when Chinese officials are supposed to visit India in just a few weeks, the Indian External Affairs Minister going up and saying these things that we are speeding up our construction activities at the border. This seems to be very odd because usually the government does not disclose this kind of information. Now, as per the external affairs minister, the construction activities have gone on considerably. For example, the length of the roads that are constructed at the China border areas have increased up to about 6,800 kilometers. It is almost double the length of what it was till 2014. The foreign minister also said that the number of bridges that we are constructing are at a very, very fast pace. Now, this is unusual and interesting because usually, if you see, it is China that employs these techniques. China has been very famous for doing this. Whenever China has to acquire any neighboring country's land, and they have done this with Bhutan, they have done this with India also. This is, in fact, the method through which they acquired the Aksai Chin area as well. China usually will start building infrastructure near the border areas. And when there is a dispute, they will say, see, this is our road. We build this road. We build this bridge. So this is our area. It is our construction at that has been done here. You did not stop us from constructing. So means it is our area. This is a Chinese method of acquiring a lot of territory that they have used since 1950s. There is nothing new in that. India now seems to be doing the same kind of a thing. The difference being, we are not claiming any other country's area. We are just strengthening our case in our sovereign territory. One other thing that China has been doing in the past is, China has been building a lot of artificial villages. <clears throat> if you remember recently, when there was a clash between Indian and the Chinese army uh, near Tawang, in that area also, in the Tawang area, nearby the border, what China does is China has been building artificial villages. Now, what do you mean by that? It's an open area where no one lives. They just come up and start construction activities and they settle some people in that area. Who are these people? 
the people that Chinese usually settle in these areas, they are actually retired army people only. So they are retired army personnel that China usually po ask them to live in this area, that come and live in this area. So, so that tomorrow, if there is any disagreement on the territory of this area, China can say this is our area. So Chinese have been using this technique of building infrastructure as much as possible. India now also has been doing this since the past decade or so. There are a lot of projects that have been built, not just on the Chinese border, but on all other countries. For example, we have now railway links to Nepal and Bangladesh. We also have the Mahakali Motorable Bridge. We have the Maitri Setu, that is a bridge between Tripura and Bangladesh. The Kaladan Multimodal Project, again, is a project to boost our own connectivity to our northeast part of India through Myanmar. All these are examples of what the government of India has been doing. Now, <coughs> sorry, as I told you, it is very significant because number one, no one asked for this information from the foreign minister. Foreign minister just gave out this information. And when the governments do this, remember, this is all a strategic decision. It's not randomly that the government can just release an information. It is all done by thinking in a very, very long manner. For example, as I told you, the Chinese foreign minister is supposed to visit India on March 1 and March 2. This is interesting because again, usually, usually you would think that when the Chinese minister is coming to India, we want to improve our relationship with China. So this kind of a strategy is odd here. Now, let me give you one more example. This is also something India is learning from China only. And I'll tell you why. I'll give you two instances. China has had a history that whenever China actually talks to some other country or whenever there's a foreign visit, they usually bring up an issue. I'll give you an example. If you remember, Prime Minister Modi had invited Xi Jinping to India a few years back. When he was in India, when Xi Jinping and our Prime Minister Modi were talking in Ahmedabad, at the same time, the Chinese troops were actually at Doklam area and confronting the Indian troops. Remember? When Indian troops and the Chinese troops were confronting, the Chinese president was in India talking diplomacy. So China has had this history that when we go and talk to some other country diplomatically at the border, we will try to instigate something. I'll give you one more example. Have you seen or if you have been following international news, unfortunately in India news, channel, news channels, we don't call a lot of international news, but you would have seen there is an issue of the Chinese balloon over US. Have you seen that? There's Chinese balloon that was flowing over US. US just shot it down recently, just a few days back. Have you seen that news? If you have, great. If you have not seen that news. So basically what is happening is US realized that over the US, over their country, there's a huge balloon, a spy balloon that is just actually going ahead. Now this spy balloon and the interesting part is the spy balloon and it's a Chinese balloon. It is going, it is actually over which state? It is over the state of Montana. The spy balloon is over the state of Montana. Now in, and do you know why Montana is significant? Montana is a state where it is, there is very less population, a lot of open area, many, very few people live there. Land is open. When you have such an open land, when you have empty area, do you know what the government use it for? The governments use that area for storing their missiles. The governments use it for ensuring that their nuclear weapons are kept there. So that is why the Chinese balloon is or was roaming over Montana specifically. China obviously said, no, 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 we don't have anything to do with this. But because they were specifically roaming over Montana, a state where the US government supposedly has stole a lot of its missiles and uh, nuclear weapons, etc. The US government finally shot it down. Now, the interesting part is this happened just a few days before a very senior official from the US government was supposed to visit China. So this is again the same kind of technique China is using. This is 
just a few days before a very senior US government official is supposed to visit China. And do tell me in the chat, uh, not in the chat, but in the comment section, who was that official who was supposed to visit China? The visit has been cancelled now, by the way. He will not be visiting. But again, you will see what exactly is the Chinese strategy. So Chinese follow this strategy very often that whenever they have a high level meeting with any country, what they will do is, let's see, we will put a balloon or let's say we will start some agitation or we will start some confrontation at the border. So it's a very common thing, common theme that is happening from China. The good part is now India is copying the same. The good part is we are also building infrastructure. We also know the Chinese foreign minister is coming to India. Okay. Before he comes here, we will tell the world, see, we are building so much infrastructure. So it's called taking a leave out of the Chinese book. What the Chinese have been doing, we can also do the same. We can do it better than them. So on one hand, you can say the timing is very odd from the Indian government side. But on the other hand, you can say the timing is perfect because that is what we want to tell that this game can be played by two and not just China alone. Now, apart from that, there are many other initiatives the government of India has taken in the past to improve border infrastructure specifically. Recently, there was a news of Vibrant Village Program. I don't know how many of you heard about that. Vibrant Village Program was a government of India's initiative that villages nearby the border areas, especially in the northeast part of India, their government will try to improve their infrastructure, give them better connectivity, have them as tourist attractions where more and more people come and visit to ensure that just like we have Chinese model villages on the other side of the border, we also have many people who will come in here. We also run the border area development program that again aims to improve the lives of people living in the border areas. The government of India a few years back also started smart fencing. Smart fencing means Rather than just depending upon our BSF or army only to look at the border, we'll use smart technology, cameras, uh, detectors, etc. So that we can detect anyone coming here. And as you can see here, the Union Home Ministry has directed the BSF. That's the border fencing, the smart fencing should be sped up. So all these initiatives have been taken from the government of India also to improve our border area or border security. The next article that we have here is from Science and Tech, uh, an article which is pretty scary to read, not a very uh, happy article because it talks about a possibility of yet another pandemic that we might see in the future. It talks about the H5N1 virus. Now, what exactly is this? This article mainly says that avian influenza or the bird flu as you call it, it's a very very famous viral infection that usually affects birds. Now, what has happened is and why it is in the news, just like the coronavirus that we saw, this virus also keeps on mutating. When we say mutating means it keeps on changing its form. So what happened was a couple of years back, there was a new form of this virus that was discovered. And that new form of virus is now affecting many birds in many countries. The sad part is and why how it become dangerous is that these birds, many of them now the virus is actually being transferred to the mammals also. This is called spillover. Spillover means when a virus transfers from one kind of animal, one kind of species to another kind of species. That is called spillover. So in this case also, it started with birds. It can now affect mammals as well and it is transferring from one mammal to the other mammal also. And that is a very dangerous sign. Because when a virus goes from one animal body to the other animal body, it also mutates within the body. What is the problem with mutation? The problem with mutation, mutation means changing of form. The problem with mutation is, even if you develop a medicine, even if you develop a vaccine to work against one specific form of virus, it will mutate and the vaccine or medicine might not be effective against the other kind of mutation. That is a huge, huge, huge issue. That is why we saw 
even when Omicron came into the picture, again, a lot of people passed away. So as COVID also started changing its form, started mutating, we had a problem that our vaccines, many of these vaccines were not effective against the new forms. And similar is the case here as well. Now, why are the scientists worried? The scientists are worried because there is a news that about 700, 700 of uh, these potential mammals have actually been killed near the Caspian Sea. So there are 700 seals in the Caspian Sea that have been found dead all of a sudden in the past few days. Now the scientists are worried what exactly could have led to these 700 seals dying all of a sudden. So they are now investigating what is it that is actually killing them? Was it the H5N1 virus? Was it something else? The worrying part is that in the same area, a few months back, there was there were some wild birds that had this virus. So was this wild bird virus able to go to the mammals and was it able to kill 700 seals or not? That is again a problem that many people are now worried about. There have been cases that have been seen in Peru as well. In Peru, there have been cases of this virus in sea lions, dolphins also. A lion has also died in the zoo because of the same kind of a virus. Now, this is worrisome. Why? Because it is this virus has a history of coming to humans as well. There have been human beings that have died because of this virus. This virus was first seen in 1996 in China. Since then, it has mutated multiple times. It has affected humans as well. In fact, so far, 800 cases of this infection have been reported. Over 50% of them have passed away. Over 50% of them have passed away. Those who are asking, what is seal? Seal is a kind of a mammal. I'm not very good at drawing, so I can't, can't draw a seal. If you can just Google, you'll see a photo. You will know what a seal is. Uh, it is a mixture of, I would say, penguin and dolphin. So a penguin and dolphin mixture would be kind of a seal. Go and Google, you'll see the photo and you'll see what it is because I can't draw it properly. So it's a kind of a mammal that lives in water. So this virus is problematic. It is killing animals, it is killing mammals and it has killed many people also in the past. As I told you, in the past, it has been over 50% fatality. Now, what can be done? As I told you, we do ensure that we have vaccines against this. We have vaccine against H5N1 influenza also. But again, the problem is that it keeps on changing its form. Because it keeps on mutating, that is a big, big, big issue. No vaccine can be 100% certain to work against all the different types of mutations. So we have to be on our toes to make sure that we actually have a vaccine prepared in case it goes out of hand. Now, there is also one more problem that you have to understand. That problem is, see, for any company, let's say Pfizer, Moderna, these kind of companies that made the COVID-19 vaccine, for any kind of company, to think about making a vaccine for, let's assume, this virus, its new form, they have to look at their profit and loss. And you might think, no, this is bad, but that is true. When the company thinks that only 1,000 people or only 10,000 people or even 1 lakh people around the world are infected by it, the companies will not make the vaccine. Because for the companies to make these kind of vaccines, they have to invest billions and billions of dollars in research. They will have to see whether it makes sense for us economically, financially or not. When they think that, yes, so many people are now getting infected, they will all buy the vaccine. Then only we will go ahead and have some research in this area. So usually you will see that these kind of diseases, the vaccine development process usually only starts when we have a lot more people dying. That is a very unfortunate thing. But that is what we usually have. And that is why just because of an article publishing in the Hindu newspaper, don't expect the companies that they will all of a sudden start working towards developing a new vaccine for a new mutation. That will not happen. This is a summarized timeline. As I discussed, in 2020, a new kind of a strain was discovered. Then it spread across other parts of the world as well. 
this new variant has been found in sea lions seals dolphins etc they now can be transmitted from mammal to mammal as well there have been many infections and that is why now the scientists are worried about that also now there are different types of influenza viruses i wanted to talk to you about so there are mainly four types of influenza viruses influenza a influenza b c and d the one that we are talking about h5n1 this is influenza a type of virus this is influenza a type of virus there are different types of influenza viruses influenza a and b are those that cause epidemic seasonal infections almost every year these are very common influenza c occurs in humans but usually it comes in dogs and pigs also and influenza d is mainly in cattle the one that we are talking about the bird flu one h5n1 this is the one that is influenza a when you say h a or h n h basically stands for hemagglutinin and n stands for neuraminidase that is why we have h n hemagglutinin and neuraminidase these are the ones and their different combinations of proteins make up the different variants of this virus the next article again is from page number 11 of the hindu newspaper on the same topic that we have discussed multiple times in the past few weeks or so that is the significance of millets how we should give more push to the millets and how the millets can be a game changer in india now you all know 2023 is already declared as the international year of millets it was declared by the fao india was the country that had pushed the un the fao to name a year after the importance of millets however even then even after all these efforts even after all of us realizing the importance of millets that yes they are important for our nutrition they don't require a lot of water they can grow in other kind of in in those a uh, climatic conditions as well where you don't require a lot of a lot of uh, taking care of them even then the sale of millets has not really increased at a speed that we would have we would have ideally hoped for even today mostly people prefer to go with wheat or rice even though we do realize the importance of nutrition that the millets contain even then for some reason or the other we have still not been able to give millets the kind of push that it actually deserves now millets as i told you have a lot of advantages they are climate resistant so they don't require one specific kind of climate to grow they can grow even when they don't have enough water even when the climate is not very suitable to them then they also grow in warmer and drier environment india has an advantage because we grow the largest number of millets in the entire world followed by china followed by niger the agriculture ministry has tried to ensure that more and more people consume millet but somehow that mindset of the people in india is not changing because see we have been so used to having wheat and rice in our everyday meal that all of a sudden asking people to switch towards millets would not be very easy and i gave this example to you earlier as well all of a sudden would you say that no i don't want to have this uh, uh, chapati that is made up of wheat all of a sudden would you say that i want to have the jowar made chapati or ragi chapati you might have it for one once in a week you might have it once in a couple of weeks but it's not something that you would do day after day after day until the doctor has advised you because of your health conditions because it takes a long long time for you to actually change your eating habits and that will not happen overnight that has to be a very gradual process there can be multiple things that can come from the side of the government the government has included this in the pds for example under the food security program government gives millets at 1 rupees per kg so government is trying to give a push towards it but this is just not enough for example there are suggestions that even in the midday meal schemes the government should try to introduce millets as a part of the midday meals but again the problem is if students or if the children don't want to consume it how far can you push the students to consume millets just because you want them to have more millets so it's not that easy there are a lot of reasons because of which millets are not 
or the consumption of millets in fat is not increasing in India. First, as we discussed, it's not easy to change the eating habits of people all of a sudden. It requires a lot of time. It's a very gradual process. Second, the area under millet cultivation is also declining. Now, personally, I don't think you can blame the farmers for this. See, if I'm a farmer and I have a choice whether I want to grow wheat, rice or millet, I would think I will grow something that can be sold at the best price, right? Or I would grow something that can be sold in the easiest manner. Why would I grow something which people are not even ready to buy? So you can't blame the farmers by saying that why is it that their cultivation is decreasing? Because they think that economically, financially, it makes more sense for them to cultivate something else. So obviously they'll cultivate something else. Then even the awareness is lacking because we are in this field, because we read the Hindu newspaper, because we read all these articles, we know that yes, millets have great nutritious value, they can grow at other kinds of climate also. But common people, they are not really concerned about millets, etc. The awareness that we have about millets and how significant they are is still low. Yes, your parents of earlier generation, your grandparents, they still know the importance of millets. They still know what is more important. But in our generation, for us, if you ask anyone what is more nutritious, they will say avocado. Have avocado, it is very good. That is more nutritious. We forget about millets and all these things that are grown in India. We are more concerned about let's have broccoli, let's have avocado. So the awareness in terms of how important or how significant the millets can be in our diet is still lacking. And that is also something that we have to work towards. Cost of millets is also high, uh, unfortunately, uh, and you can check it yourself. Go on Amazon, Flipkart, just see the cost of 1 kg of any millet. And you will see this 1 kg cost of millet is usually higher than 1 kg cost of wheat that you usually have. So the cost is high. Taste, as we discussed, people are not really uh, accustomed to that kind of a taste. We are more accustomed to... Uh, Chapati of made of wheat or made of wheat, then rice, etc. There's competition and the government support has also been lacking. Government support lacking in the sense that if the government really wants to give a push to farmers to grow more millets, maybe they can have a higher MSP so that they can encourage more farmers to grow millets, but that is also not happening. So all of that in the end means that the millets are not going off in the market at such a high rate. This, in fact, I have taken this news not to discuss. I have taken this news from today's Hindu newspaper only. If you look at today's Hindu newspaper, see this headline. Customers don't prefer their millets get the cold shoulder at G20 food fest. This one headline in the Hindu newspaper tells us everything about millets. This is, I think, in the Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper today. There was a G20 food fest organized and see what the people are saying that people are not buying millets. So if their people are not buying millets, why would the farmers consume millets? And it's an entire cycle. So there is a long, long, long way to go before millets become a part of our everyday meal. There has to be a lot of efforts on the side of the government, from the side of other stakeholders as well. The next article that we have here is about the problem of under trial prisoners. What is under trial prisoners? What is the problem exactly? Let's try and understand. What is under trial? Under trial means let us assume someone is accused of a crime. Okay, let's assume there is a case going on that you have committed a murder. Okay, and you are sent to prison. Because the police thinks that no, you should not be let out. Because if you are outside the prison, you might hamper or you might talk to people, influence them. So, <coughs> police will or the ju judge will put you in the prison. The case is still going on. The case has not been decided yet. But you are still in the prison. That means you are an under trial. A person on whom trial is still going on, there is no... Uh, there is no conviction that has been done. You have not been given the jail sentence, but you're still in the jail. And there is an entire trial that is going on against you. Now, the problem is in India, there is a huge, huge, huge population of under trial. I'll tell you two big problems. 
first big problem from the under trials a lot of them can be given bails a lot of them fulfill the paperwork but the problem is when you actually ask for a bail then you have to actually give bail bond what is bail bonds bail bond means you have to say or you have to deposit some money saying that okay i'm depositing 50000 rupees if i escape if i don't come back when the police calls for me then my 50000 rupees is gone this is a kind of a bail bond so bail bond means that yes i am going out on bail but i am depositing some money as an assurance that i will come back i am not running away the problem is most of the under trials in india don't even have money for this bail bond because they don't have money for this bail bond so many under trials are still in the jail they have been given the bail but they don't have the money to actually fill up that bail bond so what the supreme court has done is supreme court has given the directions everyone even though who don't have the money for bail bond everyone who has been given the bail should be released within 7 days within 7 days you should release them even though they might not have the money to give the bail bond number 1 second problem and let me tell you what that problem is a lot of times the cases go on for such a long time for such a long time that let's assume someone is in the jail for committing a, or for being accused of a crime and the maximum punishment of the crime is 3 years understand this someone is in the jail because there is a charge on the person that you committed a crime maximum punishment for the crime is 3 years now what happens is the case will go on on this person and the case will go on for over 3 years he will still wait in the prison for the judgment just imagine if the judgment would have come and even if he would have been guilty he would have been only convicted or jailed for 3 years maximum but now he has already spent more than 3 years in jail because the case is still just going on and on and on there are so many under trials in india like that also who have already been in the prison for over their maximum possible sentence that is still a big 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 problem now let me give you one simple homework again something that you have to comment if you read the pil the public interest litigation one of the first cases of pil in india was about the under trials only when there was a case filed about this issue only that there are so many under trials in the jail who should be released because they have already spent a lot of time in the jail a pil was filed and the supreme court ordered the release of thousands of under trials as part of the pil it is very famous for being one of the first pil cases in india do tell me the name of the case in the comment section of the video okay tell me what case is that the name of the case specifically 1980s case very very famous then the problem of under trials in india is i told you number 1 the bail problem they can't get bail because they don't have the money in fact it was nalsa the national legal service authority that reported there are 5000 some such people in the jail there are 5000 people in the jail who have been given the bail but they can't go out just because they don't have enough money for the bail bond now the under trials in india are a big big problem recently the president of india shrimati draupadi murmu she also made a speech in which she said that we do not need to increase the number of prisons in india she because there is a big problem in india the prisons are overcrowded means if there is a prison cell which is meant for two people there are four or five people who are living there because we don't have enough space so there is an idea that should we increase the number of prisons in a recent speech the president of india said no we need to focus on reducing the number of under trials in india rather than increasing the number of prisons in india as per the national crime record bureau in the last 10 years number of under trials are constantly increasing in 2020 76% of people in the prison were under trial just imagine out of 100 76 people in the prison are those who have not even been given the punishment they are just in the jail waiting for their trial to go up so these are big 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 issues about under trials in india that have to be solved the supreme court has for example at least in this case come in the picture 
ordered the release of these people without the bail bond, etc. <clears throat> Let's see if other reforms can be introduced for the under trials also. These are the important articles from the Hindu newspaper that I wanted to discuss with you today. These are the couple of practice questions. Again, reminding you, as soon as the session ends on our Telegram channel, you will have a quiz based on the articles that we did discuss. I hope all of you are attending those quizzes just to check your preparation. Make sure if you're not a part of the Telegram channel, you can use the link given in the description of the video to join that Telegram channel. These are a couple of questions. Number one, despite several government initiatives, millets haven't become a part of an Indian mainstream diet. Explore the reasons behind this gap. Second, no successful society can afford to keep people in prison just because they can't afford bail. Elaborate both these questions ideally should be answered in 250 words each. Thank you so much for watching. Have a good day ahead. Enjoy your Sunday. Make most of it. Do revise whatever you have studied in the last week or so. Make the best of Sunday. Thank you so much for watching. Have a good day ahead. Jai Hind.